Day 4 Part, Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1 You will hear part of a telephone conversation between a customer and a sales agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Now, before we go any further, could you please confirm your full name for me? Of course, it's Marge Thompson. M-A-R-G-E-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N Thank you, Marge. That's great. Now, Marge, the next thing I'm going to do is provide you with a booking reference. You should quote this in any further communication you have with us. OK, just let me get a pen. Go ahead. Very well. It's treble seven, treble zero, double four, double two. That's treble seven, treble zero, double four, double two. Got it? Yes, thank you. And just to confirm... You want to hire a car for 14 days, is that right? Exactly. Right, I can confirm that you'll be issued with a T-Grey Sword Star. Uh, what's this T-Grey Sword thing? Oh, my apologies. That's the model of car we've allocated to you for the hire period. Oh, I see. Sorry, I'm not that well up on car models. No worries. I'll give it to you again. Mind you, it's two words. T-Grey Sword Star. That's T-I-G-R-E... S-W-O-R-D-S-T-A-R. Perfect. Got it. And that's going to be at the airport when I get there on the 2nd of July, right? Right. At 3pm, it'll be there waiting for you. Lovely. Where should I go to collect it? The hire car centre? No. You're arriving at the South Terminal. The hire car centre is in the North Terminal Blue Car Park. Instead, your car will be waiting in the South Terminal Blue Car Park. That'll save you a long walk. Oh, even better. And when do I have to have the car back by? Well, we give you a period of grace. So once it's back by the 17th of July, at or around 6pm, there won't be any problem. Well, as I'm flying back on the 16th, there certainly won't. I'll surely have it back by the return date. Otherwise, I'll be in big trouble. Indeed. Now, what type of insurance would you like? Fully comprehensive, of course. Naturally, right. We'll put you down for the comprehensive then, but I must inform you that there's an excess of £500. After that, you're covered for everything. Fine. That's pretty standard these days. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Do subscribe our channel and like the video so that we feel motivated and make more and more videos for you. And please press the bell icon so that you can get notification for every new video which is absolutely free. Thanks. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now Marge, how would you like to pay today? Do you accept cheques? Unfortunately not. Only a debit or credit card will suffice. Oh, OK. Uh, I have my debit card here. No worries. Excellent. Let me just give you a breakdown of the total cost now. It's £280 for the 14-day vehicle hire, and the insurance is an additional £75. Um, will you be needing a satellite navigation system? How much? £25. No, thank you. I'll use my own. I have one on my mobile. What about the roaming charges? That could amount to even more than £25. Good point. On second thoughts, I'll take the satellite navigation. I also need tyre chains, is that correct? Not compulsory at this time of year. But I may be travelling up to very high altitudes in the Alps. In that case, perhaps you should hire them too. The chains will set you back another £25. No problem.
So that's £405 by my calculation. Uh, we also have to include 12.5% tax, I'm afraid. Oh, well, if you must. So in total, that's £455.50. Now, let me just... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Do subscribe our channel and like the videos so that we feel motivated and can make more and more videos for you. And please press the bell icon so that you can get notifications of every new video, which is absolutely free. Thanks and good luck with your English. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tutor and some students discussing science and ethics. Now you have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 and 12. Now answer question 11 and 12. In the 19th century, scientific discoveries took a long time to produce any actual applications, and scientists might have had a case for giving little thought to the social or environmental impact of their work, that all changed in the 20th century, with the huge advances first in physics and then in biology. Science started to play a much more important role in our lives, and the relationship between scientists and society became much closer. Many scientists became increasingly concerned about the ethics of what they were doing, as they quickly saw the consequences the benefits, such as vastly improved crop yields and the eradication of diseases like bubonic plague, but also terrible damage in the form of pollution and chemical weapons. Yes, but some scientists still claim even today that their only duty is to make public the findings of their research. They need to do that, of course, but I think the key points are that they ought to stop making any distinction between pure science and applied science – because in practical terms it no longer exists. And also they must accept full responsibility for the consequences of their work. Now you have 30 seconds to look at questions 13 to 20. Now answer questions 13 to 20. Let's explore that last point a little further. How can scientists put that responsibility into practice? By educating the public, particularly through the media and at the workplace. Mm -hmm. Another thing they must do is advise on what might one day go wrong as a result of what they're coming up with now. That seems essential. And just as importantly, if and when things do go wrong, they need to sort them out especially where the fault lies with the original research. Mm. How do you feel about the international role of scientists, given that their work crosses frontiers so readily? I think it gives them, or at least should give them, a global view. In this respect, some of them are better placed than many politicians to see how new discoveries are likely to affect particular parts of the world. But will the politicians listen? Mm, probably not. But I'm not suggesting getting involved with politics or politicians. Much better to raise the public's awareness of scientific issues so they can put the pressure on at election time. There's a problem here, though, isn't there, with the way the public sees scientists? They're all either mad or bad. <laughs> That's something they need to work on, definitely. To regain public trust, they'll have to show they're accountable and that science is about improving people's lives. That may not be so easy. What do you think are the areas in science that really worry people these days? Science in agriculture, above all. Mm -hmm. There's been all this media hysteria about Frankenstein foods, but there is a genuine issue here. Whether adding specific genes to plants is a valid way of increasing food production or whether it risks the appearance of new diseases, of superweeds and pests. Which links it to another controversy, using chemicals to control pests. 
and that's something else that was at first thought to be harmless, but we now know that the careless spraying of crops has led to all kinds of health problems for people, plus a devastating loss of biodiversity, with huge numbers of insects, birds and mammals simply disappearing from the countryside, fish dying in poisoned rivers and so on. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we're talking about death on a massive scale, then we have to mention the role of science in enabling the military to wage chemical and biological and nuclear warfare, which has destroyed life in so many parts of the world. OK, I think we've identified some major topics there. There's something I'd like to add, if I may. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's important for scientists and future scientists to talk about major issues like these, but we might also want to look at what we can do or not do in our everyday lives, particularly as many of us will be earning more money than we actually need for basic necessities. I'm thinking here of things like burning fossil fuels by driving everywhere. What do you think? Well, something that scientists seem to do rather too often is take planes to distant places which is highly damaging environmentally. Mm. For instance, to attend conferences on subjects like the disappearing ozone layer. <laughs> when nowadays they could probably stay at work and use a video conferencing link anyway. Which may in fact be an example of how progress in computer science can impact positively on the environment. But going back to harmful things, mm. what else can be done? Again, on the air transport theme, there are the huge distances a lot of consumer goods travel before they actually reach the shops in this country. This seems another extreme waste of energy, especially if much of what is being produced and carried is packaging. Perhaps it's worth shopping for more locally produced items. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about plans for a university sports centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Before we go on to look at specific sports, let's think for a moment about the non-sports facilities we really need here. Uh, things like better changing rooms and showers. Yes. If this really is going to be a state-of-the-art building, it'll need to have high-tech amenities, but mm. also places for people to chill out after all the exercise they've been doing. Somewhere they can meet up for a drink or whatever afterwards is essential in a place like this. But what else? Mm. How about a sauna? Those who use them say it's the perfect way to relax after you've trained. The trouble is, though, that there's a debate going on about how safe they are. Some say it's risky to be exposed to all that heat before or after strenuous exercise, which, of course, is exactly when people in sports centres want to use them. There have also been problems with people overusing them to sweat off weight. So, to avoid any possible dangers, I don't think I'd include them on my list. Talking of dangers, I wonder whether we ought to have some sort of facility where minor injuries like cuts and bruises and sprains can be treated. Maybe. It would seem to make sense with all the mishaps that are bound to occur when you have so many people running and jumping about and so on. Ah, hold on though. Isn't the new medical centre going to be built right opposite? Yes, it is. It should be finished by the end of next year. <laughs> then there's no point, is there? Anyone who gets hurt can go over there, where there'll be much better treatment than anything mm. we could offer on site. Yes, I can see that. What we should provide, though, is a facility with full-time physiotherapists, for everybody on the campus, that is. As well as treating people, they could work on prevention of things like muscle tears and strains. Right. 
and something else the new place ought to have, also as a way of preventing injuries, is somewhere to test just how fit people are before they start lifting weights or running long distances and so on. Yes, I was going to suggest that. When I was at the Newport Centre, they put me on a static bike to check out my cardiovascular system. Ah. Then they worked out how much body fat I had. All of it valuable information telling you exactly what shape you're in. Another thing I've heard some universities do, especially some of the newer ones, is provide rooms and equipment for lectures to take place actually inside their sports centres. How do you feel about that? Well, as it happens, I've got first-hand experience of that too. We used to have some of our sports science lectures right next to the main sports hall, and I think it made what we were hearing about seem much more relevant to the real world. So, in that respect, I definitely think it's a good idea, yes. Mm, I can see that, though my own feeling is that we need to have more concrete reasons. Mm. The problem is that we won't have unlimited space, and somehow I don't think providing more lecture halls is going to be one of our priorities. So, I'd be against that one, I'm afraid. Anything else? Hmm. Well, just that I agree about the need to have a place where people can go for a chat and maybe have a coffee or a bite to eat together. That was something I always thought was one of the strong points of the centre in London. It was a great place to find out about new activities from the people who actually did them. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Do subscribe our channel and like the video so that we feel motivated and make more and more videos for you. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So what about the main sports facilities themselves? What do we need? Well, we don't need a rugby pitch because there's already one on the campus. Um, the same's true of table tennis, really. Mm. Most of the halls of residence for students have their own tables, so there's no point in using precious space here for any more. Agreed. Uh, something none of them have, though, is any sort of pool. A lot of students have complained about this, saying they have to take a bus downtown if they want to go for a swim. Yes, that's definitely one for this place. Perhaps a jacuzzi, too. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would. Perhaps next to the squash courts, just down there to the right. They are very popular, by the way. I think we should have a couple more here, don't you? Absolutely. And another sport that's been growing in popularity is volleyball, especially since we did so well at the last Olympics. Uh, don't you mean basketball? <laughs> yes, I do. Sorry. Anyway... The point is that there is a court in the old gym next to the Students' Union building, but it always seems to be fully booked up, even though it's not very good. And there's nowhere else on campus to play. OK, let's have one of those too. How much space have we got left, by the way? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a psychology undergraduate describing the research she is currently doing on expertise in creative writing. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. For my short presentation today, I'm going to summarise the work I've done so far on my research project to explore expertise in creative writing. Essentially, I'll share with you the process I underwent to gather my interim findings. First of all, I should give a little relevant background information about myself. Before I started my current degree course in cognitive psychology, I studied English literature, and, as you can imagine, this meant I spent a great deal of time thinking about the notion of creativity and what makes people develop into successful writers. However, the idea for this research project came from a very specific source, 
I became fascinated with the idea of what makes an expert creative writer when I read a well-known 20th century writer's autobiography. I won't say which one at this stage, because I think that might prejudice your interpretation. Anyway, this got me thinking about the different routes to expertise. Specifically, I wondered why some people become experts at things, whilst others fail to do so, in spite of the fact that they may be equally gifted and work equally hard. I started to read about how other researchers had explored similar questions in other fields. I began to see a pattern that those studies which involved research in a lab were too controlled for my purposes, and I decided to avoid reading them. I was quite surprised to find that the clearest guidance for my topic came from investigations into what I call practical skills, such as hairdressing or waiting tables. Most of these studies tended to use a similar set of procedures, which I eventually adopted for my own project. I'll now explain what these procedures were. I decided to compare what inexperienced writers do with what experienced writers do. In order to investigate this, I looked for four people whom I regarded as real novices in this field, which proved easy, perhaps unsurprisingly. It proved much harder to locate people with suitably extensive experience who were willing to take part in my study. I asked the first four to do a set writing task and, as they wrote, to talk into a tape recorder, a technique known as Think Aloud. This was in order to get experimental data. Whilst they were doing this, a research assistant recorded them using video. I thought it might be helpful for me in my transcriptions later on. I then asked four experienced writers to do exactly the same task. After this, I made a comparison between the two sets of data, and this helped me to produce a framework for analysis. In particular, I identified five major stages which all creative writers seem to go through when generating this genre of text. I think it was fairly effective, but still needs some work, so I intend to tighten this up later for use with subsequent data sets. I then wanted to see whether experienced writers were actually producing the better pieces of writing. So I asked an editor, an expert in reviewing creative writing, to decide which were the best pieces of writing. This person put the eight pieces of work in order of quality, in rank order, and using his evaluations, I was then able to work out which sequence of the five stages seemed to lead to the best quality writing. Now, my findings are by no means conclusive at this point. I still have a long way to go. But if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them and go... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.